Hello creators, it's good to hang out with you again. We have a special treat for you today. I have someone, a friend of mine who I think most of you guys are familiar with, who just logged in, you, you can't see him right now, but he's waiting and he's excited to talk with you guys here today about time management and productivity on YouTube. Because I know one of the most common questions that I get, usually through Twitter, is people asking me, Tim, like, how do you manage to do all of that with seven little kids and a marriage and relationships and life outside of YouTube and running a business and having a staff of people and working with clients and publishing on multiple channels and I mean, I'm not the only one. You guys have lots of stuff going on too. And so what I want to do with you guys today is just Q&A. Now, I know a lot of times what we do is we're reviewing news and things that have like updates that have happened in the online video industry from the week before. And we're talking about what those means for us creators. And there were some significant updates this past week, which I will be sharing with those of you who are patrons and sponsors of the channel. So after this live stream is over, I'll be posting all that for you guys down there. Um, and you can check that out. If you're not a sponsor or patron already, we'd love to have you become one. And we'll talk more about that kind of stuff there. But today, it's just going to be Q&A. And what I'm going to do is we're going to record this as a podcast also. So any questions you ask, make sure you're just kind of from okay with those being a little bit broader than just YouTube here. And let's see. Yes. And those of you guys who have been sponsors for longer than a month, you get your badge changes. So thank you, Melody, for being – that's why you have the plus one. And Creator Fundamentals, you got the plus one, all that kind of stuff. So thank you. Thank you guys for your support. Um. A quick announcement real quick while you guys are coming in before we dive in is that uh, next week is our sponsor only live stream at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So I'll post more about that. But that's our call in show. You guys get to call in on your phone. We actually get to talk, which is great. I love doing that. And I uh, look forward to do that with you guys next week. All right. So I'm going to hit. Um, well, actually, let me show you our guest. Then I'll hit record on the podcast. Let me bring in our guest here. First of all. Hey, Roberto. How are you, man? I'm doing awesome. How about you, Tim? Um, I'm doing better than I deserve. It's good to have you here. It's going to be a great conversation with uh, these people about productivity, time management as YouTube creators. And uh, it's a good conversation because you and I were just talking about that a little bit for yourself, which I want to hear a little bit more about that from you as well. If you guys sure. don't know Roberto, there is a link Oh, there's not a link because I just had him come on last minute. Never mind. Go to – I'll add that after. If you guys are watching the recording, it will be there. Um, uh, Roberto Blake number two. Is that what you still go by? Or did you – Yep. yep YouTube.com slash Roberto Blake number two. Uh, a lot of good stuff from him about growing on YouTube and creativity and entrepreneurship. So go check him out. And he talks a lot about time management. So it will be a great conversation. Your questions – Leave them in the chat, and Heidi is in the chat. It, her name is – well, her name is Heidi, but her channel is Scandinavian Today, and she will be helping us by taking all your questions from the chat and adding them to um, a Google Doc that we can kind of quickly uh, stay up on. So we can stay on top of your questions and make sure we get as many of them answered as possible for you guys here uh, today. So leave those here. Thank you for Heidi for your help. And let's start the recording here of the podcast section. And then we'll uh, dive in. Well, hello, creators. How are you guys? It's great to hang out with you again for another Video Creators, po- creators Podcast episode like we do every Tuesday here on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, all the places you listen to your podcast episodes. It's great to hang out with you. We are all about helping you grow your YouTube audience so you can spread a message that reaches people and changes their lives. And one of the things that goes along with that is having the time to actually do it. Now, I know for me, like I'm super busy. I got seven little kids. We have, my wife and I had seven kids in eight years. I didn't even know that was possible, but we did it. <laughs> and and we got a business that we run, a family business. We got multiple YouTube channels that we're running. And we've got like our own, like outside of YouTube relationships and community involvement. And I homeschool our kids. And we've got tons of stuff going on. And finding time to YouTube, you, you, do YouTube properly, I know, is is a challenge for for all of us. And so what I want to do with you guys today, those of you who are listening to the podcast, I'm actually live streaming this and we're gonna ask a lot we're gonna answer a lot of questions from different creators who are struggling with this as well. Um, but before we jump into those questions, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine, Roberto Blake. Hey Roberto, how are you, man? I'm doing awesome, Tim. Getting so, geared up for VidCon. Yeah, we both of us are going to be hanging out together in just a few days. Why don't you, for people who aren't familiar with you, 
tell us a little bit about yourself, about your channel, about your backstory, and just kind of bring us up to speed on what, what you're all about. So I'm a creative entrepreneur. Part of what that means is that I've learned how to make money on the back end of creative services, things like photography, design, video, public speaking, etc. There's just a lot that goes into that. I came from a world of freelancing, doing design and advertising, marketing, social media, those things in corporate. And uh, with YouTube, I'm a YouTube uh, certified marketer just like yourself, Tim. I grew my channel from zero to 300,000 plus subscribers. Um, I took YouTube seriously in 2013. Like a lot of people, I had a channel that I never used in 2009 except to comment on other people's videos and upload twice a year. You know, you can't call yourself a YouTuber if you're uploading twice a year, (laughs) whatever. So, um, you know, I mean, you can. I wouldn't. Uh, So... uh, a lot of my channel focuses on the things that I've learned and the things that I want to share about that journey so that people can take, you know, one of those videos and apply it to their life and be a little bit more successful and a little bit more happier with their, their outcomes, whether that's a tutorial on some software that feels really intimidating and they don't want a tutorial that feels boring or, or stagnant, um, or if they want just like a piece of one tip or one advice or top 10 tips for something, then, you know, I put that content out there. It's helped a lot of people. I'm very humbled by the fact that people come up to me and tell me, hey, your stuff helped me get a job or your stuff helped me start that business or helped me grow my business. Um, So that's just really cool. And I'm the founder of Awesome Creator Academy, which helps um, influencers learn how to properly set up and run a business, especially in the digital world, and also helps digital entrepreneurs understand how to market themselves and leverage the same tools and social media platforms that influencers take advantage of. So it's a bridge between those two things. And I built AwesomeCreatorAcademy.com so that I also had something for myself where I could teach outside of YouTube, so I never felt constricted by the yeah. limitations of the platform. Ah, you sound like me. You got a few things going on. <laughs> Trying to do all of that plus create consistent content on YouTube is mm-hmm. is sounds like a challenge for sure. Uh, what I want to do is just hear. Do you have any tips and advice? First of all, is these and you guys were asking questions in the chat. The great ones we're going to jump in. And thank you, Mike, for becoming a sponsor and the super chats that are coming in. We're really going to be looking forward to diving into all that with you. But just right off the bat, what comes to mind for you, Roberto, when you think about like helping creators be able to become consistent on their channel and finding time or versus making time? You know, what are some of your top productivity tips for helping creators manage their time better? The first thing, Tim, is I tell them, I I ask creators, I ask my students about this all the time, I ask them, well, what's your current process for how you approach making content? And usually what they tell me is they struggle to come up with an idea, then they shoot the video for that idea, then they edit it, then they do their thumbnails, their optimization, they upload it to YouTube, and I'm like, oh, Awesome. You're doing it absolutely the wrong way if you want to be consistent. <laughs> um, and then, and then they laugh or cry. And then I explain to them that yeah. or scream. And then I explain to them, it's like, you know, for two and a half years, I did daily content on YouTube pretty regularly for like two and a half, almost three years. That's why in from 2013 to, to now, I have over 1200 videos, which you and I both know is something most creators don't even do in a decade. Marquez just did his. MKBHD. He just did his thousandth video and he's been on the platform for a decade. Like, you know, it's a very hard milestone to cross. Philip DeFranco, like all these people have been around forever. Not all of them have done even a thousand videos just yet. And I do not recommend doing daily content without a doctor's note or a therapist. Um, <laughs> or no life at all. Or all of them. Yeah. Uh, like, so. But here's how you can approach doing more content or approach doing daily content without driving yourself mad. And part of it is batch recording first, Mm -hmm. but also creating a content calendar, creating a bucket list of ideas. And if you're doing things that are similar, it means that you can plan out your production days. And I would separate production days, planning days, and editing days just like real television show producers and film producers, they do this. They have production meetings, they have writing room meetings, and they sit down and people ideate, they come up with what they're gonna do, they do any research they need to do, they set up all their scenes and stuff like that. Then there are production days, days that are dedicated to just shooting. So one of the things I do is I have what's called a B-roll archive, meaning that if I don't want something to be just talking ahead, I shoot a bunch of B-roll that I know can support this video, but also future videos. I shoot things from different angles, so it's no voice, it's just me with a camera. I also sometimes sit down and quietly record 
voiceover B-roll as well, meaning voiceover things that I know I'm going to say or want to talk about at some point, so I just have that audio clip so I can drop it in. That way I'm not always doing it on the fly. I have things set aside so that even if I'm not making a video today, I'm positioning for a video I might make in a, another day or a couple yeah. of weeks or whatever. Yeah. So then if I have this bucket list of ideas, it means that if enough of them are similar, I can film all of these back-to-back -back in one sitting. Especially if I know I'm going to edit a 10 minute down, a 10 minute video down to an eight minute video. Well, okay, I could do three of those in one setting. This won't take an hour, even with breaks. And then that's an hour and I've got like those three or five pieces of content for a whole week. And I could do a theme week. Mm -hmm. Or if that's stuff I'm releasing weekly, then that's the whole month already set up, filmed in advance. And then if I need it to not feel quote unquote boring talking head, but I'm an educator, so I can do talking head. But the thing is, this would work for other types of YouTubers because it's like, well, Roberto, what if we're not doing how-to videos? I'm a vlogger. I'm a, like, if you're a vlogger, you're a vlogger and. And then there are such things as story time vloggers where all they do is sit in front of a camera and then yeah. tell, tell an exaggerated version of the story. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, even that becomes hard to produce over after a while as well. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things that you said is just like planning is, is like so key because a lot of people I know, they just like, especially vloggers in your case, in the example you gave, they just go out and shoot a ton of stuff and then they come back and they're trying to figure out what the story is and they spend a lot of time weeding through photos they don't end up using or don't need or is unnecessary and they didn't get the photos they actually did need for whatever the story ends up being at the end. So I feel like it's, you can save a lot of time just by planning, which is, uh, let's start digging some of these questions here, which it goes right along with what some of these people are asking. Um, first of all, super chats. Thank you. Christ centered ironworks, um, says you, both of you have been instrumental in growing my blacksmithing channel. Tim, your wife inspired my wife to start her own family blogging channel on July 1st. Thank you both for all your videos. Oh, you're welcome. And then savvy, um, TV, so thinking of leaving my full-time job in Canada, moving to a home in India, and doing YouTube full-time to post three videos a week instead of one. Tried, but not possible with a job. Thoughts? Um, do you have any thoughts for him? I mean, I, I feel like it is possible with a job. Plenty of people do more than that. but Well, Savvy TV does um, some videos that are a little bit more involved. So his turnaround is harder, but I think better production and pre-production planning could definitely help there. I don't know if he's outsourcing the editing, but I think that those things, even with a job, are entirely possible because yeah. what you have to understand is that full-time creators like me and Tim, we do have a job. It's called our businesses. And some people, <laughs> they have a family on top of that. I'm single. Tim's got you know seven rugrats to wrangle, a marriage to keep alive, and then he has stuff he does outside of YouTube. And what he did was he cut back on travel. So it's no offense to anyone who has a nine-to-five job, but I'm, I'm telling you, most people who do YouTube, quote-unquote, full-time, their job is more than sitting down, shooting a video, editing a video, uploading a video, and that being like a three-hour turnaround. And mm -hmm. it's not all day, every day, eight hours a day to make a single YouTube video. It's running the business behind that. It's taking meetings with sponsors. I was just talking with Sarah Dietschy about this in New York. I talked with Marquez about this in New York. I talked with so many people, creators big and small, on a regular basis about the fact that running a YouTube channel is a business. It's For a lot of people, it becomes accidental entrepreneurship. Like they didn't realize, oh crap, I just accidentally became an entrepreneur. I have to become business savvy. You, you take meetings. Sometimes you have to hire people. Sometimes you have to do things that have nothing to do with the channel itself and it's working with the brands and doing other things. Sometimes you have to have these networking relationships to go to the next level. Just like if you were in, I wouldn't say it's like, it's different than say a blue collar job or even a secretarial desk job. It's like if you were a middle manager in corporate America that's what being a full-time YouTuber is. Being a full-time YouTuber is like one is it's almost the exact same job as when I was a marketing manager at a company. It's a, yeah. it's the exact same job. Yeah. Story Greenlight asks a uh, good question. Thank you for the super chat. Um, appreciate it, Jeff. What are your top priorities for activities to outsource first? I think the first thing that I outsourced was video editing. And a lot of you guys have heard this story before, but I'll share it real briefly for those of you who haven't. It's I was bottlenecked. I had no more capacity to do anything else on my channel. There was no more room to make any kind of money uh, because there were, I was keeping like all these spinning plates going. And if I dropped one, I'd lose some income and I couldn't afford to do that. 
but I knew I couldn't add any more plates either. So like my income was capped and so was my time and I was just like stressed out. <laughs> and so I took, uh, make a long story short, but I took $3,000 out of our personal savings account and I said, I'm going to hire this for an editor and with the amount of time that this editor frees up with, with me, from me, I need to use that time and I need to, um, I need to make $9,000 during that time so that we can, the math works. So I did that and instead of making $9,000 over the course of three months with what I paid for $3,000 in editing, I made $15,000 in just the first month. Well, not me personally, the business made that. I get a paycheck of a small part of that, of course. But, um, and so I quickly learned that lesson of like, oh, it's more important for me to be working on my business or on my channel than to be working in my business or in my channel. And so the editing for me was first, uh, well, bringing someone on my team, the very first thing I outsourced was taxes and accounting and bookkeeping and all that kind of stuff for sure. <laughs> that was way definitely worth the money. So first came accounting. Then came um, – and then actually the next person I, I worked with was a business consultant because growing a YouTube channel is one thing, but making it financially sustainable is another. So I know plenty of people who have millions of subscribers who aren't really making that much money on their channel. At least they're not full-time yet. Um, so I hired a, a business advisor. Again, I didn't really have the money for it, but I was investing in something I knew was possible if I had the right coaching and guidance. And then that's when the editor came on. And then after that, I hired a business manager and admin people just to kind of help take care of email, scheduling, um, clients, answering all the questions that come in via email and like people wanting to interview me. And so do some research on the on the podcast. Are they worth me, like all, me putting my time into like all that kind of stuff and just doing all that work and but anyway, in terms of top priorities, that's where I started. What, what would you say? Uh, where would you put those top priorities? Roberto. So I still do like 95% of everything, which is like longer than I should, but I'm also slow to hire because of like personal, just like trust issues and with letting go because being that more creative person and then also being very business savvy, it's hard to let go of things sometimes. But what I did was I have somebody that I've uh, turned uh, some of my email over to certain email inboxes. I hired um, a customer support person for Awesome Creator Academy to do support emails for that business. Um, I'm about to hire my sister half time to be a personal assistant to actually wrangle the mix of certain priorities for me in life and in business because I can trust her with my real email to mm -hmm. just like help me clean and clear that inbox. I can like have her handle certain things with prioritizing my travel and helping me schedule those things, maintain things in my personal life, help me set up things for my dogs. Like, so having a family member, like when you, if you have the luxury of incorporating people from your family into your business because you have trust issues, um, that's great because there's less anxiety and you can take something off your plate and you know it's people that have your best interest at heart. Yeah. At least I would hope so. At least I would hope so. Well, um, even without trust issues, that's a thing. Like even for people, like just handing your baby over, like whether you have trust issues or not, like that's like something intimate that you created. You poured your blood, your sweat, your tears, your time, your energy, yeah. resources into making this thing and to be like, here you go. Like that's really right. scary. I remember – like I can't have my video editing over to people. Like no one else knows how to edit like me. Like how would they know to make this video? You know, and I yeah, that's not just you. I think that's I'm, a normal thing. Yeah, I'm a really efficient ed editor. I'm like ridiculously efficient and fast at editing, and I shoot in a way that makes editing easy. I can edit and crank out a lot of stuff. The thing is. I've fallen out of love with doing simple editing and I make things harder than they need to be sometimes to challenge myself, but that's not practical for scaling a channel or growing a business or any of those things. So what I'm doing is I'm outsourcing uh, more of that. Um, in fact, I'm actually, there's, I have someone that's dedicated to my new YouTube channel, new podcast that I'm launching at VidCon, the Create Something Awesome Today podcast. Uh, it's an audio, it's been an audio podcast where I've done a few Skype interviews as well, but now I've done some in-person interviews um, Marquez, Sarah Dietschy, um, Kim Raluna, uh, Brett Conti, um, Willie Morris, like a lot of a great lineup, a great starting lineup to do weekly video releases. So I filmed the first month. I'm giving that editing of the video over to someone else. I hired um, this wonderful creator, Zoe, um, 
you know, she was a film major. She's a YouTuber. She's, you know, she's really good. And mm-hmm. she, I've actually recommended clients to her and they've been nothing but satisfied. So, good. uh, and I've used her in the past. So, um, I'm working with Zoe, but for day to day content, I'm actually looking at, uh, some of the folks you've worked with, um, you know, for that. Cool. So, um, because I know that based on our similarities, I know what to expect from them. They do such a great job with what, you know, your content is mm-hmm. that I'm like, okay, that helps my anxiety. That helps my trust and I'll pay what it costs for yeah. the audio editing of my podcast. The audio editing of my podcast, I've already prepaid and I outsource a lot of that to music radio creative. Um, Mike and Isabel Russell, great mm-hmm. folks from the UK. They were at social media marketing world with us. Uh, you know, uh, they have a tremendous podcast of their own. They edit, podcast for a lot of our friends. So Pat Flynn, I believe they do it for social media examiner as well. So, um, getting these things off my plate that are mechanical in nature or technical in nature that don't require my creativity. Cause what I want Tim is I bought back my time to go back to being an artist again, not for social media, but to be a photographer again and like do real art again. And even with my thumbnails you've noticed me getting crazy in photoshop again i'm going back to my roots so yeah. I, think I feel the, a relief i think the thing the main thing about like scaling this and then i'll move on to some other questions here too but it's about putting good systems in place that that make it scalable you know it, it, as long as it depends on us as creators and we're the only ones who can do the job like everything's going to get bottlenecked eventually but there's a reason why you can go to any McDonald's in the world almost and get like the same experience. It's because everything has been systematized. They can hire almost anyone, put them into a process that leads to a predictable result every single time. And so like at video editing, we all follow a process when we edit our content. We just don't know what it is because we maybe never thought about it or identified it. But if we would sit down and be like and turn it into a checklist of here's where you That's make this cut. Yeah, exactly. Like you turn it into a system, then you Same can hire filming. people. Same yeah, whether it's filming. shooting I, or email I, or anything. I leave this gear mostly set up. I know how every stitch and every piece of this gear works. I know like this thing that that when I take this out on the road, I know exactly that it's going to come out well and how it's going to work, you know, yeah. with almost no exceptions and flaws to it. Exactly. Um and so I just like I have a system. I have a system for my travel gear. I have a system for like stuff that's in front of the bookshelf. I have a system for this live stream stuff. I you know, I have these very strict, rigid systems uh, in place, and I have my use case scenarios in place. I have a formula for making awesome videos, That's which right. actually is the name. By the way, I made the course where I talk about that. I named it the Formula for Awesome Videos. There you go. Yeah. So I would highly recommend you guys read a book called E Myth. And it's about, um, I think the subtitle is like, why most small businesses fail and what you can do about it. And it's, it's I'll buy totally, it from Amazon right now. You totally, it's about those systems, about putting processes in the place that, you know, whether it's your email, you know, so you put, it's a checklist. So for me, it's um, bringing someone in my email, say, okay, cause step one, like you might not know this person, but search my inbox for their, their name and see and just get caught up to date with my, what my past relationship with them is like. If it comes up with zero, they know it's like a brand new person. If they see all these other threads and get quickly caught up and like, okay, I understand who this person is now, how Tim works with them, and then move on right from there or we set up meetings. You know, there's ways to systematize everything. And that book will really help you get started on a lot of things, not just for your own sake, but also for, for making it more scalable going forward. Um, I want to thank Mike from Haunted Road Media for becoming a sponsor. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your support and looking forward to seeing you in our call-in sponsor only show um, next week. Hopefully that will work out for you. And then a sponsor, Creator Fundamentals. Hey, man. Uh, thank you for your question. It said, has either of you ever used a roadmap to plan out the coming year to prioritize what project slash expansion you want to tackle next? I use a tool called Trello for that, my team and I, and that's what we do. There's a calendar system in there, and we just, yeah, we plan out. Uh, even for our family's vlogs, like my wife and I will sit down, look at our schedule, our calendar for the upcoming month, be like, okay, Tim's going to be gone for two weeks here, so we got to get ahead on vlogs so my wife doesn't have to worry about that while I'm gone, and she can just focus on trying to keep the kids alive. And so she will we'll get like ahead in two or three weeks in vlogs so we know that's coming rather than being stressed out for the whole thing, and we'll plan, all right, you're going to that doctor visit, I'm going to that event, you're doing it, and we'll just plan out, here's all the stories we're going to tell and map them all out so that 
um, things aren't stressful and we have, we usually have a few week buffer anyway, but, um, they kind of help us. So, so that, and then with the new storytelling direction, I'm kind of going with video creators as well. I got a lot of that mapped out. In fact, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to be doing one with, um, story green light here in the chat with Jeff, uh, here at VidCon. He's a Hollywood video editor and me going to Hollywood with him and shooting his story. And that's like him and I have already spent a few hours just trying to figure out the story that we're going to tell. And then I spent a few hours just working on outlining that to a storyboard so I know what shots I need to get and what where we need. Like I hired another camera uh, videographer to come with us because we for some of the shots I'm going to need help so that we can tell the best story possible by planning it out ahead of time rather than just sitting a sit down talking video, which are great, but I'd rather tell a story rather than just tell you about a story if that makes sense right no it makes uh, absolute sense you'd rather show than tell yeah um so yeah that's that's how i'm doing it and uh, thank you for being a sponsor man i really i really do appreciate it hopefully we'll bump into each other at bit summit or something like that i think or uh let me know in chat if you're gonna be at at um vidcon uh, Dr. D- uh, Sten Eckberg, how do you find time for YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, etc.? How do you do that, Roberto? <laughs> find time. People call it, no, you have to make time. But I don't know how you make time because it's always the same regardless. I don't know how you make more of it, but what does that I, look like, like for you? I try hard, very hard, and I fail constantly at this. Uh, and by that, I mean not making my answer sound condescending. Um, and my, my somewhat condescending answer is it's like, it's not that difficult to find time. Actually. The thing is everyone says they don't have enough time to do something. They haven't audited it. And by that, I mean, they haven't sat there and thought about how much time do I need to spend doing Instagram to get a quality result? And is there a process that would allow me to do that relatively quickly? Is there a process that I can refine and make that very uh, manageable? How much time and when do I reply to comments? And when do I do like literally, you could be in every single social media platform if you have the uh, – but you don't have to do every platform daily. That's the other thing people don't account for. You could do – all right, so here's an example. Here's an example of – I'll literally, literally give you a formula for how somebody could spend just a few hours, especially if it was like a, a brand manager, right, could crush it with content across multi-platforms. Change my life. Go for it. <laughs> all right, so I'll give you a primary example. If you schedule – an interview and you do a 45 minute to an hour long video that uh that could be cut up and edited beyond the final product into probably four or five videos for a clip show h3 does this for their podcast joe rogan does this for his podcast this is something that a lot of people do with their longer form content gary v has done it with when he did the ask gary v show he would do five questions do a whole show but then he'd also cut it up into the five answers as individual videos and release those at a later date um, and they still do that on the Ask Gary V channel, which they split off from the main channel. Okay, so that's one sit down of 30 minutes to an hour to produce what turns out being six pieces of content, plus the audio strip from that for a podcast, plus stills of that could be distributed on Instagram. Or if there's someone there with a smartphone or a camera, they can take dedicated photos or selfies that are not just stills of the screen capture from that whole thing. Uh, for Instagram. And even if you want to do completely separate content for Instagram, you could take a bunch of photos in advance. If you guys haven't noticed my grid lately, it's literally like six or three or nine photos that were from the same photo shoot, but different poses and different things and different captions. And it's the same amount of time to produce what over a period of time I have literally from like spending 30 minutes there's 30 posts that I'm going to get out of that over the course of the year spread out of those same photo shoot. So there's all these like little things about if you batch things and if you create a process, it's less time than you think to create an abundance of content. If you were going to do a certain channel, you could do one long piece of content, cut it up into segments and have multiple things that you put out, and it took an hour to produce it. You can edit it yourself or outsource the editing. That's like another hour, but the week is done or the month is done, and that's that. In terms of then comments, you could schedule 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, and 10 minutes in the evening. If you felt like you wanted to reply to everybody, you can probably get it done if you break it up into 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes in the evening. And it's not even 10 minutes. They dedicate to that. It's 10 minutes that's part of like if you're on a train or a bus or a passenger in a car – 
10, 10 minutes when you're waiting in line for something that that time would be squandered anyway. You're just maximizing the time. It's not about finding or making time. It's about optimizing time. Yeah. So people aren't <clears throat> auditing their day and realizing, gee, I'm squandering time just standing in line and not doing something productive or, you know, sitting in the Uber and not doing something productive whatever it is, sitting on the plane. When I'm on these plane rides, I'm listening to audiobooks getting smarter, but then I'm also writing notes or writing articles or writing things and setting up my month, writing emails that are going to go out to my newsletter because I'm already stuck in this plane. What else am I going to do at the time? Mm -hmm. So if you maximize these this micro time that you have and if you audit it, you'll find that, gee, if I don't care about doing fancy produced videos and I just want to go live, you could go live on YouTube at your desktop or at your smartphone, and that's a video you didn't even have to edit. You got out a video that week, and it could be a good video because you're responding and engaging with people, and it's real time, it's raw, it's unfiltered. But then, okay, maybe that's just 20 minutes of live streaming. You could also – then when you're in that Uber, you could live stream on Instagram. I constantly live stream on Instagram and Ubers. And that's like 50 minutes, 20 minutes of an hour because I'm in the, I'm in the car anyway. And that's content and it's engagement and it's being involved with your audience. People aren't just taking advantage of the time that they have. When I'm in that Uber, sometimes I'm tweeting or I'm video tweeting at people to make them feel special and make them feel like, Hey, I really do care that you followed me. And I, like, I care that we're having this relationship. Yeah. Um, it, it, so it's it's all these things. And again, it's also taking things off your plate. If something's mechanical, put a robot in charge of it or hire an employee if it's mechanical. Yeah. If it doesn't call your creativity, your heart, your soul, your care, get rid of it. Another thing to consider too is that uh, – one of the, and I, I totally agree. Integration is kind of how I think about what you've just said is like how do you integrate different aspects of your life or your job, your business and things together a little bit better. When you're self-employed and homeschooling, you can do that a little bit more than when other people are in charge of your family rhythms. But the other way to think about it too is just in terms of priorities because I don't think anyone can do everything. Like there's always going to be more that you can do. And so I like even if you integrate everything completely, like you just can't do everything. And so I I kind of think about it more in terms of priorities, which is like, okay, this number one, this is the highest priority right now. This is number two, number three. And at some point, there was just a line in the sand be like, you know what? Those things are important, but they're not the best. They're not the most important things. And so like like you like you mentioned here, Roberto, there was um, – uh, last year, I cut back and completely on traveling. I said no to more. I said no to all speaking engagements, all speaking gigs, all of that because, like, my wife was pregnant with our seventh child, and we just had just had twins that were born, and so like our life was crazy, and I couldn't afford to leave the house and leave her with all of them. And so now we have other nannies and people, which was other systems we put in place. Yep. But there's a there's a season of life where just like traveling and speaking is great. It's fun. It's even good for the business in some regard. But that is not the most important thing right now. Our family is. And so you say no to good things. So you can say yes to the best things. So I think that's part of it too. Yeah. Dan B. asked a great question we probably should have started with, which is a, a definition of productivity, just kind of like a, like a starting point. And the way I think about productivity is how well – we produce things that have maximum impact with the least amount of, I don't know the word is, cost or expense or you So know, what you're something doing to is us. like, don't break down the word productivity. Production and efficiency equals productivity. So it means production is you have to do this thing efficiency, anyway. There's yeah, a process. So it's a, so it's a process. Now mm -hmm. you're doing that process with the least expenditure of time, resources, energy, um, et cetera, to get the optimum produced result so you know productivity is production efficiency and optimization exactly. so that's really what you have to think about and what that comes down to is there's a law of diminishing returns and i yeah. tell people that this is the problem with the youtube argument of quality over quantity quality over quantity is one of the worst mindsets in YouTube and in create in creative services and production because it doesn't account for logistics and it doesn't account for efficiencies and it doesn't account for the law of diminishing returns, meaning that if I produce something, making it 5% better doesn't make me more money and doesn't do more for me. Making that thing that someone already said yes to that they bought 5 to 10% better, it doesn't really matter. It matters to me maybe as an artisan, but for my family, for my livelihood, it doesn't help me. Making that thing five times helps my family making yeah. that thing five times serves the market demand 
if the market demand of acceptable quality, because when I say quality over quantity, doesn't matter if people are saying, oh, you're saying don't try or produce crap. I'm saying no, the market doesn't want crap. Like there's a threshold of acceptable quality. Once you've met the threshold of acceptable quality, the problem is people's ego makes them try to exceed that and they don't get anything out of exceeding that and they get frustrated. I worked even harder on these videos. I put my heart and soul into it. Why didn't I get more views? Well, the other thing is by making a second video that was just as good as the last thing that performed. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, though, that um, like I think maybe I'll just speak personally, I suppose, which is I I get bored of the same thing I've been doing for the past five, ten years. Right. And so like, I can't just keep going like I need to do things that are inefficient but they feel rewarding. They feel because it's a new challenge, a new thing for me to figure out to overcome. So like I'm doing this. I'm doing yeah, the same thing. Exactly. I'm so it's not. It's not and just about time. That. Yes, and my channel reflects that. By the way, my channel reflects that. If I only did what was in demand, my numbers would be better. Because right. I mean, we both yeah. know what's. We both know what'll perform. I, right. I don't want to make the real way to get more subscribers in 2018. Like <laughs> I'm not making yeah, that definitely. video. Like, but but I am really know. passionate about this other thing that takes. Uh, at least 10 times more time, energy, resources to make. Uh, rather than cranking out, like one, uh, a few years ago at VidCon, I did 35 interviews. I mean, 35 pieces of content in one weekend at, at VidCon. This year I'm going, I'm only making one, maybe two, and I'm spending all day making just one of them. Like literally, like I'm leaving VidCon and I'm going – down to Hollywood with with uh, Jeff here in the chat, and we're gonna spend all day making one video. I'm like, whoo, that so is I'm not efficient. Vid- it is yeah, not. So I'm, going pr- to Vid- so I'm going to VidCon and I'm making like ten videos, so it's like the middle ground. But yeah, the, I don't recommend thirty five. <laughs> but I found, but I found an efficiency hack for even this is what I did was I co opted a lot of people who are going to VidCon as attendees that are also aspiring YouTube filmmakers. And I co opted them to have them give me permission to use a lot of their footage and B rolls and to also do things and capture behind the scenes and B roll with me, but also just whatever their VidCon experience is so that I can use it so that I can use it in three documentaries that I've scripted that have Ooh. three different angles. Yeah. So, and I'm doing the same thing at Vid Summit. I'm doing cool. the same thing at Video Marketing World so that I'll have all these conferences where you have creators and entrepreneurs and social media influencers. So I can do these three documentaries. I can do a documentary about digital business and I can use a lot of this footage in addition to other interviews that I'm doing when I travel. And I can also use some of the interviews from VidCon. I can use that B-roll. I can use the behind the scenes of me and I can do voiceover documentary stuff outsource a lot of the editing, do some of it myself for certain segments of the thing, script it out. But the thing is, that doesn't take away from the core content that I'm going to create while I'm there, plus the recordings of my speaking engagements while mm-hmm. I'm there. And the footage from that gets to be used. So like, I created these, uh, these things in the process to get something that's exciting for me, but something that's practical. And part of that was I had to go outside myself. And my limitations, I had to leverage human capital. And I had to be collaborative. And that's where, you know, I found that there's some magic to where yeah. I can do things that aren't boring to me um, and aren't the, the redundancy, but also are wildly practical. Yeah. We, uh, w- one of the things I'll be doing also kind of with that is recording my sessions and then making them using that as content for sponsors and patrons. Mm-hmm. And so like rather than sitting down and planning out a whole new training and recording the whole thing, I'm like, oh, I'm already presenting a full length in depth training. I'm just going to record it and then make that available for my patrons and sponsors so that like people who didn't weren't able to make the full trip, you know, spend thousands of dollars to go and listen to it in person, they can get that get that later. So and that doesn't work for yeah. every event because every event has different rules in terms of my you know, that my kind of rule stuff, is but. if you're not paying me, I do what I want. <laughs> well, yeah, it depends on what you sign, though. That's the bigger rule. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, no, I nego- I'm a you know me, Tim. I'm a ruthless negotiator. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Um, and you're welcome. Designing with Leticia McKinney, twenty dollars. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim, for always sharing amazing content. Blessing. You're welcome. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for that. And speaking of support, Haunted Road Media slash Mike, um, our I think our newest sponsor. Ask a good question. With tools like Trello, do you just set up laundry, a laundry list of tasks or do you find it easier to set up broad categories and break down the tasks 
underneath each. How do you approach that, Roberto? I do both. (laughs) Okay. Because, like, for me, one of the things that, like, I'm being more vocal about is the fact that I've had to put structure and routines in, in ways that work for me specifically in place because of my ADHD. Like, mine is manageable compared to most people's. Uh, but I know how my brain works, and so sometimes I need more than one system in place, believe it or not, because it just depends on where I am today in, in the scale. Like, so I might need this version of it today, but I might need this other version of it tomorrow. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with what Brittany Nicole asked too, which is how do you create a process? And I think it's different for different people. And I highly recommend, you, like I said, that book E-Myth, which the chat pointed out, there's like 13 different E-Myths. Which one are you talking about, Tim? Uh, if you're listening to the recording of this later or watching the recording later, there's a link. I'll put a link in the show notes down below along with a link to Roberto's channel you can check out. But it's E-Myth Revisited, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. And it's a paperback or audio book or Kindle book, whatever you want. It's by Michael E. Gerber, and I'll I'll put a link to it. You guys can check that out. But that's that definitely goes into a lot about systems. One of the, in terms of process, Brittany, one of the things that I do is I first start down. And I think of the goal. What is what is it I'm trying to accomplish here? What is the primary thing? So that when I work on this, I'm like I'm actually working towards a thing, and everything like aligns from that. So then it's like, and then I just kind of reverse engineer what I need to do. So for example, let's say my process for writing a story now is I start with what is the log line? What is the point, the summary of this story? And kind of like your, your, your train, your teaser, if you will, but something that just kind of summarizes what is the story all about? What is the meaning behind the story? And then I'll start with a character who wants something, overcomes conflict to get it, and is transformed by the process. And most of the time, there's a guide who comes in and helps the hero to reach their goal. And it's actually really hard. I'm trying to position creators the, as a it's hero. It's the monomyth. But, it's the hero's journey. Yeah, the monomyth. but that's the structure. you know. So I always start yes. with like a structure or a system, basically. That's the system for the story. Well, every story, basically, at least that Western society loves, and then plugging in the characters and the roles and what's the conflict the hero's trying to overcome, and then how is it different? How are they different at the end of that? And what does that as what does that mean for us as creators? And how do we identify with the hero so that we feel compelled to overcome that obstacle on our journey? All those things. It's it's, it's a lot more complicated than it looks, <laughs> but um, but putting those those systems and processes in place. Like I, how do I do it? I start with like the main goal first of all, and then I kind of draft everything else out after that. Josh, the Josh speaks he says I spend way too much time in the grind of editing and uploading. Not enough time on how to expand the business end of it. I don't want to get too far into the ends of the, of the business stuff here, uh, but in terms of like spending too much time grinding and editing and uploading and not having time to work on the things that make it financially sustainable, do you have like one thing that you would say, Josh, start here, Roberto? I would say audit the process for editing and see where that time is being spent and squandered. Are you spending time babysitting the renders? Like, cause that's the like big bottleneck of producing a YouTube video is waiting around for it to render based on what your hardware is. Cause you know, it, you may not have bought, built like a two GPU machine or whatever. Um, so there's that, oh, especially if you're working on the road on a laptop. So audit the process. If there's a bottleneck of efficiency, if it's hardware, then supplement your hardware to make the efficiency faster in terms of editing and rendering. If it's the process of the editing and writing, rendering creatively, consider an audit whether you think you're the best in the world to do this or whether or not you should outsource that and hand it to someone else. Then from the business side, consider, well, what will grow the business? For me, for example, I know that like I have products now. I should just hire a salesperson or somebody that is a master of Facebook ads and just pay them. And I'm going to do that. I just have to find the right person. But like I could just scale the business by putting someone in charge of, okay, the only thing, at least for me, for the time you're working for me, that you have to think about is selling things. So now I can focus on being creative because maybe that's what the efficiency bottleneck is for me. So that's an audit I did on myself is, okay, more sales make more money, not more YouTube content. But if I creatively want to market and do more YouTube content and I want the expression, if it's a priority, then I'll do that and focus on that someone can sell because anybody who's good at selling can just sell. That doesn't require me specifically. And I may or may not be the best salesman in the world or even the best salesman for even my own product. So it's a matter of learning and 
auditing yourself both in efficiency and process, but also in ego of what are you doing and is there waste that is there just to satisfy your own ego? Because I'll be honest with you, Tim, I think there's a portion of loving saying I do everything myself that I did for a while past the point of it being necessary or past the point of it being about my trust issues and hiring good people. I think there are probably enough people in my network and in my life at this point to where I probably could let go and they are probably good enough or as good at me or, or better than me at certain things that I could hand over to them. But I think that there's a small part of ego and the pride of beyond the fear of, oh, it's my baby, a pride of like, but I like the narrative. I like saying that, like, I'm a one man band and that I'm a machine yeah. and like how like how I can do everything. I'm a martyr. But look at me. A, yeah, <laughs> but, but it's not practical. Yeah. It's not practical. And even though I've gotten good enough at it to where I spend a lot more time with my dogs, I spend a lot more time working out. Um, I spend a lot more time traveling, even though I've gotten good at it, even though I don't not good enough to do that and do daily content unless I live stream a lot. Like it's a balance. And I would say you have to audit. You have to audit your ego. But you have to what audit I hear, your efficiency. You have to let go. What I hear you saying is, yeah, you have to let go and you have to determine like what's most important for you. And, uh, you got to let go of like some of the editing, maybe bring on someone to maybe do what I did. And like, I'm just going to have to make a financial investment into my channel, whether it's you or getting some outside investment if you really need to, but I would rather see you not do that. Cause that leads to a lot of other complications, but, uh, but, but getting, or, or, or one of the ways I first swapped too is like, Oh, uh, that, that business person I told you about, I brought on the very beginning, uh, they were looking to grow their YouTube channel. I was looking for business advice. And so we swapped, you know, once, yeah, yeah just doing some bartering and things like that can help you get started as well. So I, I would say Josh, and you know, you've been around this community for a year, actually, even before the video creators community, I, I, I knew you from the YouTube stuff and, and, uh, you know, I, I think you need to put a good plan in place for how you're going to execute. And then even if you don't have the money, like just say, all right, I'm going to take this money out of savings. I'm going to pay 3000 or whatever for someone else, uh, at least to get the first rough cut of the video edited so that you can finish it if you need to, but have a plan for how you're going to make more money on top of that, what you're paying so that it becomes sustainable for both you and the person who's serving you and you're paying and you're serving them by paying them in return. So, um, I, we can talk more about that if we count if you want, but I, I think um, for those of you guys who really want to dive into that topic, talking about selling things, Roberto, uh, my course is called Turn YouTube into Your Career. I, I, I feel like, and I don't say this because I made it, like I really believe like this is the course, like any creator who wants to learn how to go full time on YouTube, they need to go through this because it's all the stuff that Roberto and I are talking about just beginning to end. I saw it at Adobe a few, about two years ago and uh, at their headquarters in Seattle. And it is just like that step-by-step -step process for how you grow a business on YouTube. I turned it into a step-by-step -step process for you guys, for YouTube creators. So um, I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes if you're listening to the recording of this as well. But yeah, I, I, I don't say that because like I'm just trying to make a buck. I, I genuinely believe like it is a great investment for what you're, what you're trying to do, uh, Josh, and, um, and other of you guys as well. I think people, I think in general, if people are trying to make it, quote unquote, like on YouTube and they want it to be a full time career. They need to find somebody who's done it and they need to get that advice. They need a process. They need a system for it because otherwise you're floundering, you're guessing, you're, and yeah, people learn that way, but it's unnecessarily painful and it takes longer. Whereas if you just had someone who's done it to say, look, here's what you, I mean, this is why sometimes, sometimes people go to school, they put themselves into debt because it's the only way they know how to get the process. For becoming who they want to be right yeah. maybe like some people do that other people they go to seminars and conferences and follow the greatest speakers around the world because that's how they're going to get the secret sauce is these people have already done it and there are other people who are fortunate enough to have a mentor in their life that might be a parent or a grandparent or a relative or just a really great teacher or friend that can tell them here's what i did and here's how it applies to you for right. anyone else, though, because sometimes you're either not blessed like that or sometimes it's wildly expensive. The reason I believe and that I support when yourself or our friend Sean Canal or Sonny Larduzzi or Amy Landino, whenever anybody is selling these courses and these things, and the reason I support and the reason I advocate for you guys besides you being friends is that, like, I understand the value of courses and that they exist for everybody who either is not blessed enough to have a mentor or not blessed with the skills of being a reverse engineer. 
because I can look at something and break it down because it's like, that's just a God given gift. I can just, I understand, I comprehend, but yeah. not everyone's built like that. And there should be an answer for those people. And I think a course like yours is genuinely the answer it's for those people. It's reproducible. It's, it's helped. And I don't want to like, go into the course here necessarily, but I do like, I, I, I stand behind it 100%. I am confident that the people who take it, go through it and implement the things will take the price of the course and earn a hundred times, a thousand times more than that in the course of a few months to a, a, at least a year if they actually, so it's like a great investment, I believe. Anyway, so. Check it out. If you guys are interested, I'll stop because uh, I could I could get really excited about what the potential that has for people. You got yeah. five dollars for from Crystal Vanner. Thank you for. I feel like I'm like one of those like uh, nonprofit like see, you know PBS. Yeah, yeah, like oh, but no, I really do appreciate you guys, Crystal Vanner, for the five dollars. Thank you for all the good info, creators like my for creators like myself. Um, would love whenever you can for you to look at my channel. Thanks. Yeah, we're not going to do that here today, but I really appreciate your, self, your support. And then $5 from Beamed Up Tech. Love seeing both of you here. Yes, I love having Roberto on the channel. Um, so, Roberto, um, for people who don't know who you are, they can find you at youtube.com slash Roberto Blake 2. And those of you guys who haven't checked him out, you totally should. Link in the show notes because he's doing a lot of the same stuff that we are, except for, I would say, Roberto, you're serving creators in ways better than I am, in ways that oh, I wish I could do. Right. And I look at him like, man, that Roberto guy, like, look at all these, like, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, I wish I had time for that. But I think we're serving creators in different ways, but I really, I really appreciate what you're doing for the community. And, um, I really think that all of you guys should go check out his channel and kind of follow along with the, the rants that Roberto goes in to and the processes and the tutorials and everything he's doing for you guys as creators so definitely you guys should go check that out and if you're not already a patron or sponsor we've got a call-in live show coming up next week at 2 p.m eastern time um so that would be on monday i'm trying to do some quick math in my head it was the 25th i believe is that right is that next monday i think that's right um coming up here and uh, just for you sponsors, this is like a private intimate time for us to, to catch up. And if you're listening to the recording of this, we'd love to have you join us too. You can just go to the link in the show notes and become a sponsor and join those times where we, you can actually call in and we can talk and discuss your issues and the things you're going over and, and trying to figure it out on your channel. And so that would be a lot of fun. I love connecting with you guys. So thank you for your support. And if you guys are going to be at VidCon, looking forward to meeting you guys there. Otherwise, and, and, and Roberto will be there as well. So you can find both of us there. And in the meantime, thank you guys for hanging out. And I will see you guys again next Monday for the live stream at two p or at one p.m. Eastern time, and then two p.m. for the sponsor only stream. And for those of you guys who are listening to the podcast of this, we will see you guys on Tuesday next week for another episode just about how do we grow our channels, reach people, and change their lives, which I know Roberta and I are both totally about. So thank you guys for hanging out, and we'll catch you guys soon. Bye.